Now, most Scots know that it wasn't only William Wallace who won the Battle of Stirling Bridge. And if you want to hear about the other hero of that battle, then this is definitely the video for you. Now, the Battle of Stirling Bridge, it was two armies that came together to form one. Two leaders and two united forces. One from the north, led by Andrew de Moray, and one from the southwest, led by Wallace. And they came together to face the army of Edward I. Now, in this video, I want to focus on Andrew de Moray. And to do that, I'm going to take you to Avoc Castle, the birthplace of Andrew de Moray. Now this is Avoc Castle, also known as Ormond Castle. Well, at least what it used to be. Now this was the home of Andrew de Moray. Now unlike William Wallace, who was the son of a minor knight and from minor nobility, Andrew de Moray's family were nobility. His ancestors had been sent to Moray by David I to keep these northerners in check. Now his family once owned these lands, held titles and possessed castles, now, while little remains of these today, there is a significant reminder on this hill, and it's a Scottish flag at the top, and at the base of the flagpole lies the Moray family insignia crest, commemorating Andrew de Moray. Now, in 1286, something happened that would shock Andrew de Moray's life. King Alexander III of Scotland had died, and he had died without any living heirs. Now, what, what happened here is this created a power vacuum in Scotland, so you started having all the main families kind of fighting each other for the crown of Scotland. Now, I don't want to go into that too much. It's called The Great Cause, and it's a whole separate video of uh, who got to be, who should have been king, and then, but essentially what happened is Edward I came in and took control, took advantage of the situation because there was no apparent heir, and they had looked to Edward for help, all the nobles in Scotland, they had looked to Edward I for help to essentially adjudicate who should be king of Scotland. Now, Edward I, being very cunning that he was, he saw a, a, a point to take advantage of here. So he came in and said, right, okay, I'll decide who will be king, but if I'm going to do that, you all need to agree that I'm your feudal overlord and you will give me men and send me money whenever I call. Now, the Scottish nobles at that time, they didn't really have a choice because it was either a choice between that or civil war. So they chose to pay homage to Edward. Now after that process, he, Edward I, chose John Balliol, who was one of the main candidates to be king. So now King John, John Balliol was king. Now, towards the end of 1295, 1296, Edward I of England essentially had been clicking, he essentially had been clicking his fingers and expecting John Balliol to jump to his tune. He wanted soldiers and money for his war in uh, France against the French. Now this didn't go down too, uh, too well with the Scots and then King Balliol in Scotland, they actually, at the end of 1295 into 1296, they had signed a treaty with England's enemy, France, declaring that they were now allies. Now, upon news of hearing this, Edward I was absolutely furious. You can imagine how annoyed he would have been that Scotland, in his eyes, had went behind his back and allied with his mortal enemy, the French. Now, Edward I was actually in France at the time, near the end of 1295, 12, 1296. So then he made his way back to England and started gathering an army to march north to deal with, with what he thought as this rebellion. So at the same time, John Balliol, he started gathering all his forces. Now, during this time, Andrew de Moray and his father, they came from Avoc to go and join John Balliol. So he had assembled his army 10 miles north of Dunbar in 1296. Now, mean, in the meantime, Edward I's army had laid siege to Berwick-upon-Tweed, which was in Scottish control. Now, during that time, Edward I lay unspeakable damage and horrors on that town and apparently the killing went on for two to three days of and it was estimated obviously it's very hard to judge approximate estimations for something that happened so long ago 
but it's said that he slaughtered around 15,000 people, 10 to 15,000 people of the town of Berwick upon Tweed. Now at the time, the population was estimated to be around 30,000. So you can imagine the horror of slaughtering half the population would have been. So after he'd done that, uh, Edward I had then sent his forces to go and lay siege to Dunbar Castle, which was a very important strategic castle in Scotland at the time in 1296. But Edward I, he stayed in Berwick and he sent the Earl of Surrey to command his forces to go lay siege to Dunbar Castle. So during that time, a portion of the Scottish forces that was made up of a lot of nobles, including Andrew de Moray and his father, they went around the English behind them at Dunbar and was preparing an assault on the forces laying siege to the castle. Now upon news of this, the Earl of Surrey then took a portion of his forces, mainly consistent of cavalry, and then marched southwards to meet this Scottish force. And then they met, which is known at the Battle of Dunbar, now, at this battle, it was predominantly made up of cavalry from both sides, the Scottish and the English. So the Scottish met the, the English forces and they had been positioned on a hill uh, south of Dunbar. And then when they saw the English coming, forming up their ranks, the same, what they thought at the time, there seemed to have been some confusion with the English formation of their army as they were coming down. And upon seeing this, the Scots, who were led by the Earl of Buchan at the time, they decided to charge, disregarding their advantageous position upon the hill, thinking what they had thought was a good opportunity to attack, but in hindsight it was a disaster. Because when they charged down the hill, they didn't realise there was a massive ditch at the bottom of this hill. So when they were charging towards the English, who were on a little hill themselves, the charge had slowed when they came to this ditch area at the bottom of this hill. Now upon seeing this, the English had then quickly resumed their formation and then the Scottish forces were just in complete disarray and then the Earl of Surrey ordered the charge to the English forces. Now, once they had charged the Scots, it was just an absolute rout. The Scottish nobles and knights, they fled. Apparently it was minimal casualties, but importantly, the English had captured many Scottish nobles and they had, importantly, they had captured Andrew de Moray and his father. Now this is quite a, a impressive scalp for the Earl of Surrey because there were so many nobles, it was estimated around 200 nobles were captured after this battle. So they were then all sent to the Tower of London. But Andrew de Moray, miraculously, he escaped when he was sent to Cheshire to go in prison, uh, to Chester, sorry, uh, to go in prison. Now there was an interesting story behind that because apparently, he was in uh, the prison at the time and the, the jailer, his, his jailer, he apparently had made a deal with the jailer or bribed him somehow to then let him out of the castle. Now what happened there is he made his escape from England and made his way all the way back up Scotland here to Avoc Castle. Now I'll let you believe that part of the story. Apparently the jailer was in debt and Andrew de Moray made him an offer he couldn't refuse and then managed to escape. But it's something like you'd see out the Great Escape coming all the way back here. It's like James Bond or something. But anyway, he made his way back to Avoc Castle and he actually retook his homeland here. So during this time, Andrew de Moray continued to have a rebellion in the north of Scotland. Now word of this had reached Edward who was in France at the time. So with limited resources and unable to go and deal with it himself, he actually sent a few Scottish nobles who were imprisoned in England. And then amongst these nobles were uh, the commons who he had released. And one of, they were actually, funnily enough, they were actually related to Andrew de Moray, the Lord of Badenoch. He was actually Andrew de Moray's grandfather. So when they had been tasked with taking an English force north to deal with this rebellion and to capture Andrew de Moray, they, agreed to it and they said, yeah, we'll come here and we'll help you out, Edward, no worries. So then they marched to Aberdeen and then they had uh, marched from Aberdeen to Inverness. Now, the area between Aberdeen and Inverness and the north, it was, a lot of it was controlled by Andrew de Moray who had been attacking these English garrisons and these castles, but he'd obviously at this point unsuccessfully tried to take a castle. 
and he hadn't taken Inverness Castle yet, but he'd taken Avoc Castle, his homeland. So this force comes from Aberdeen North, trying to look for Andrew de Moray. Now he actually didn't doesn't attack the force. Whether he knew some of his relatives were in command of it, who we don't know, but they just shadowed the force and they didn't actually meet at all. And a long story short, what happens is uh, the, command, the Scottish nobles in command of the force, the Commons, they sent word to Edward saying, sorry, we came here, we couldn't find him. We tried our best, we'll try again next time. So then they actually left uh, this area north of the Highlands and they went back to the Lowlands in Scotland. Now, during that time, that just gave Andrew de Mora the chance to retake the majority of the castles here. And that's exactly what he did. He, he took Inverness Castle, and importantly, he took Uckert Castle, which back in 1297 was such a strategically important castle because it controlled trade and military movements through the Great Glen, which separated North and South Scotland. And back then, that was like the main route through Scotland uh, in the Highlands. So he'd taken Uckert Castle and he'd gained control of Scotland in the north and he was essentially the, the leader of the northern part of Scotland. Now at the same time this happened, somebody of the name of William Wallace, you might have heard of him, he killed the Sheriff of Lanark at this time. So these things were happening at the same time and the, the news of this reached Edward in France. Now obviously here in this he would have been absolutely furious because he's trying to fight the French and expand his kingdom in France. Now he's got this rebellion going up in Scotland which he thought he had Scotland under his thumb after imprisoning so much nobles. He had imprisoned King Balliol. Now he, now he gets word of this Andrew de Moray in the north and this William Wallace in the south. So he says right, he sends word to his men in uh, Berwick the Earl of Surrey and Hugh de, Cressing, Hugh de Cressingham, and he says, assemble an army and deal with these rebels. So that's exactly what they do. Hugh de Cressingham and Earl of Surrey, they take charge of this task and they assemble a massive force of it's estimated to be around 10,000 infantrymen and around 300 cavalry. So upon word of hearing this massive force, William Wallace and Andrew de Moray, they actually join forces. You have to remember there were two separate leaders. There was an Andrew de Moray, he was actually you know, the higher born of the two because he came from nobility, his family were nobility. William Wallace came from what we know as minor nobility. His family weren't nobles, he was a commoner, but he wasn't a commoner, he was from minor nobility and Andrew de Moray was from higher nobility. But nevertheless, they must have had something in common because they joined forces and became a bit of a team. Now, once they, the English had gathered their forces at Roxborough, they had marched north towards Stirling. So once the English had started coming across the bridge, just two abreast, they, um, once they'd gone across the bridge, there was around 5,000 men who'd crossed the bridge. It was essentially the vanguard of the English force. Now, once they had gotten there after a few times, they'd during the day they'd crossed a few times back and forth and importantly when they're crossing the bridge you could only have two people side by side you know two horses abreast going across the bridge because it was extremely narrow and the reason we know this is because through the wonders of archaeology the bridge was discovered at low tide in the river at Stirling and they saw how small it was and once they got to the north side of the bridge at that point Andrew de Murray and William Wallace they then charged English forces with their children's long spears has essentially forced the English uh, vanguard into the river behind them and many of them drowned and were absolutely massacred and they also, the Scots, they cut off the bridge importantly so the rest of the English troops couldn't cross the bridge to help them so they just had to watch in horror uh, their comrades being killed and massacred which would have totally depleted their morale. Now upon seeing this, once it's estimated around 5,000 English troops were massacred by the Scots. It was a resounding victory, an absolute annihilation of their force. The Earl of Surrey, he actually fled with his tail tucked between his legs and fled to Berwick, closely followed by the other portion of his army. Now during this time also, Hugh de Cressingham, he actually died during the battle because he was in command of this vanguard that went north of the bridge. And it's said that Wallace and his men, they actually fleshed him alive and removed his skin and they all used his skin as like the baldricks on their swords, so legend says. But sadly, Andrew de Moray, he got mortally wounded in the battle and he later died the following year 
from his injuries. Now, this was such a huge blow to Wallace because Andrew de Morey, he was seen as like the mastermind of this battle. And the reason he's seen as the mastermind of this battle and using this tactics is because he was vastly more experienced militarily than Wallace. And also, when Wallace had his first major battle in solo command, he was soundly, resoundly defeated by Edward I at Falkirk. And a part of this is because he used the Schultrins, the spear formations, in a very defensive manner. They were fixed, they didn't move, they just formed large circles of Schultrins, and the English cavalry just killed, the English just killed them with their archers because they were static. So essentially, that's why Andrew de Moray was so, such an important part of the Scotland rebellion at the start of the, uh, the War of Independence, the First War of Independence, is because he was seen as the mastermind behind this. So it, I just wanted to spend this video talking about Andrew de Moray because he's really a forgotten figure in Scottish uh, history and he was such a pivotal uh, character in this story of the War of Scottish Independence. And who knows if he had survived, who knows what would have happened at Falkirk or the battles that followed. But he was, you know, a, a great commander and he was sadly missed in the wars to come after Stirling Bridge. So folks, I hope you did enjoy that video on Andrew de Moray. It really is, he's an interesting character in Scotland and he's really not talked about enough and he's not given as much credit as William Wallace. But as we've seen that he, he was just as an important figure as it was William Wallace was in Scottish history. And that's why I wanted to talk about him during this video. So if you did enjoy the video, folks, please leave a like, subscribe to the channel. And if you don't mind, leave a little comment also, because those are the ones that really help the video grow. And I enjoy doing these videos. And the best way, if you want to support me, is by leaving a little comment, good or bad, preferably good but i don't mind some criticism either positive criticism at that so folks take care and i'll see you in the next video